so I, I was thinking we could start with the wind hover, uh, subtitled to Christ our Lord. Indeed. So this this is um this is one of my favorite Hopkins poems, and I first encountered this particular poem when I was about. 17 as an undergraduate, um, not Christian at that time, and I had n really no idea what it was about, um, but I loved it. <laughs> so there was something in that, again, that musicality and that imagery that seized my heart, you know, um, so many years ago and, uh, and, and still does. So why don't I read it out loud and then we can talk about what's going on in this poem. Um, so The Wind Hover. I caught this morning morning's minion, kingdom of daylight's dauphin, dapple dawn drawn falcon, in his riding of the rolling level underneath him steady air, and striding, hi there, how he rung upon the rein of a wimpling wing in his ecstasy, then off, off forth on swing. As a skate's heel sweeps smooth on a bow bend, the hurl and gliding rebuffed the big wind. My heart in hiding stirred for a bird, the achieve of, the mastery of the thing. Brute beauty and valor and act, oh, I, air, pride, plume, here, buckle, and the fire that breaks from thee then, a billion times told lovelier, more dangerous, oh, my chevalier. No wonder of it, sheer plod makes plow down cilian shine. And blue bleak embers, ah, my dear, fall, gall themselves, and gash gold vermilion. One thing I wanted to ask, and I know we're not going to talk about the rhythm much, but um, of all the, the, we're going to read about four poems here in this episode, and of all of them, this I found the most challenging to read out loud myself and sort of know where the emphasis should be. They've got, um, in the first several lines, there's a lot of really long lines there's sort of uh where he he puts he ends the line in the middle of a word in the first line kingdom king is the end and dumb is the beginning of the next line um so over the years how have you kind of uh figured out sort of like where the pulse is or how to how to make this um audible both in its its sort of line breaks and in the the rhythm but also in the continuity of the thoughts? Well, part of that this is a great question. Part of that is just lots of experience reading poetry um, mm -hmm. and, and knowing, for instance, to to go with the meaning and not with not being simply guided by the end of the lines. You know, that's the number one tip for reading a good poem out loud. Don't just stop dead at the end of the line. Pause where the meaning pauses. I mean, you can give slight pauses right. at the ends of lines, but you really want to follow the meaning rather than just stop at the end of it. And mm -hmm. this is a particularly good example. I've even talked about this in the introduction um, because he's he's so playful with his with his rhyming. But I mean, kingdom, he's he's rhyming king with wing, but doing it by breaking it in half. It's kingdom. But why not? He's Hopkins. He will break his word in half and make his right ending rhyme word the first half of it. So if you if you I think the key is to realize that this is actually a sonnet. It's a very tightly structured sonnet. It's a um, Italian style sonnet. It's got the, the eight and the six. And if you break into that and you take away the strange to us indentations and the extra spaces, um, then you can see, oh, it really is in that sonnet structure and sonnets characteristically use iambic pentameter. Um, and that, is itself the natural rhythm of English. English wants to have the iambic meter. So if you know that that's your baseline meter, the iambic is the da dum to be or not to be. That is the question. Five beats in a line, um, mm -hmm. uh, alternating soft and, and stressed. You can do that. I, this is gonna, I'm gonna do a deliberately sing song. I okay. caught this morning's morning's minion king. And then we get to the next line. Now we have a couple of he's he's irregular kingdom of a couple of unstressed ones. Daylight dauphin, dapple dawn drawn. Okay, he's ramping up the alliteration. That's irregular. Falcon in his riding of the rolling level underneath him steady air. So he's got a basic pulse of okay. the classic sonnet meter. 
that he deliberately disrupts at certain points with things like alliteration. Yeah. Um, but if you've got that basic pulse, that allows you to feel yeah. the flow of it. And the challenge is to know where something is kind of like a triplet feel inserted in there and things like that. Yeah, and that's and that's where I think it benefits these are almost like speed bumps to help us slow down and, and read it properly because mm. you can't rush through a Hopkins poem. You just can't. Um, so it forces you to slow down and to savor a line and to really pay attention to, well, what's the flavor of this? How does this roll off the tongue? What, what's the meaningful word in this line? Um, has he given me any clues to it? Like putting and all in small capitals um, right. The and is not a word that would normally get a stress in mm -hmm. a line. Right. Um, so he's it, if we slow down and, and savor, then it gives us what we need to see what he's doing. We've got the basic structure that he gives us that that regular iambic pentameter and that sonnet structure. Um, so we we have the, the the eight and the six, the the initial part, and then the turn in the sonnet. Yeah. This, this, an, this is one of the things I love about Hopkins is he's using traditional elements to give us a place to start with, to give us a substance so that then he can do things with that that are exciting, that are innovative, that surprise us, um, that shock us even as poets, as, as readers of poetry. But it doesn't come out of left field because he's given us a grounding for it. And how are you dealing with Dapple Dawn Drawn? To me, that sounds like it ha really has to be drawn out, you know, so to speak. Um, it doesn't feel like something you can force into a quick I am. Exactly. Kind of it's, thing. it's, um, you know, I, I am myself a poet and I write sonnets. That's my poetic form. And one of the things as a, as a good poet, you have to not let rules be a straitjacket. You've got to be right. willing to not have the rhythm be perfectly regular, because if you yeah. have things be too perfectly regular all the time, then then what you get in fact is a characteristic of late victorian um mm -hmm. poetry which was absolute regularity and perfection of meter to the point that it was like a snooze fest um, right so he gives you the regularity to give you something to go on he's not just throwing everything to the winds because then then you have nothing and then and this i think is a fault of some more recent poetry you know more right. the last few decades he realizes the value of that structure, but he also realizes the value of the judicious step away from the structure, right. as with dapple drawn drawn falcon. Just a yeah. Great line. Great phrase. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, well, can we go through some of this and, and kind of look at the, the annotations and, and kind of eliminate, illuminate some of it? I almost said eliminate. Um, <laughs> illuminate. So, when, well, we can start with the title, uh, Wind Hover. Well, as I annotated, it's a type of, it's a kestrel, it's a type of falcon. Um, and in particular, it's a falcon, as I note here, which hunts its prey by using the wind to hover above ground, then making a steep dive when the prey is sighted. And so from the beginning, he gives us an image of a bird of prey, um, a hunting bird, um, but one that has a very interesting, you know, it, it sort of, well, it hovers, it dances on the wind, it, almost in, as if it were still, but it's still because it's constantly in motion, adjusting to the winds. Hmm. So immediately he gives an image from his observation of the natural environment that sadly is much less accessible to the modern reader than it would have been for his contemporaries who would right. have seen kestrels hovering on walks, for instance, in the countryside, if they were able to do that. We probably see them on nature documentaries. Um, right. But that gives us our first insight that he's choosing this image of a bird of prey and he's dedicating it to Christ our Lord. And yes. then as we go into that, we see that he is actually identifying the bird as an image of Christ, which is just really powerful. Christ is a bird of prey. Interesting. Right. You know, Dauphin might be an unfamiliar word, but you know, if you're Catholic and you know about the story of Joan of Arc, that might be the one place that you're familiar with it. You know, or meaning Henry, the, of Henry the Fifth. That's where I encountered it. <laughs> All the okay, yeah, Shakespeare's Henry the Fifth. Yeah, the historically is the is a gloss here, the eldest son of the King of France. So the right. idea of calling him Kingdom of Daylight's Dauphin, he's the Prince of the Kingdom of Heaven. Yeah, he's Christ. 
And dapple, of course, one of his favorite words, meaning kind of what, like uh, an interplay of, of colors mixed together. Yeah, it's in the um, light and shade. Um, yes. So like you're walking through the woods and you see the interplay of light and shade mixed together yeah. on the floor. Yeah, of course from, the Kestrel's on... feathers are like kind of a dappled, you know, browns and, and creams. Um, and we have the dawn light. Um, so we have all these these images, this this color and light and movement all in these these opening lines. And and again that in his riding of the rolling level underneath him steady air, syntactically a bit weird, but then yeah. the, the wind hover is hovering over the rolling level, over the rolling hills beneath him on steady air. He is on the air, but he's steady because he's, yeah. he's hovering. So we see him leaving out the preposition here with steady air. Yeah. And that's something that he does a lot. He does. Um, yeah. Also reminding me of, <laughs> of Latin, except that we don't have word endings in English to indicate that. Yeah. But you know, he, um, knew, he knew Latin intimately. So this is undoubtedly yeah. an influence on his syntax. Yeah. Um, striding high there, how he rung upon the rein of a wimpling wing. Uh, okay. Rung. This is interesting because we know the word ring as a noun, uh, meaning a sort of the shape of a ring, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but to use it as a verb... I guess there's ring around the rosy. That's maybe that's a maybe that's a verb. But but to use it as a past tense, yeah. that is that really makes you immediately think of a bell, uh, you know, having rung we we or or even a rung of a ladder, but not of the the shape of a ring in the past tense of a you know the verb version of that. So you have to think about it a little bit to and and to Hopkins get to is that. is well aware of the overlapping associations. So the idea that it gives us the connotation of bells ringing is right. is in fact a, a, a level. It's a nuance because this is about Christ, whom we worship in churches that ring bells. Um, right. So this is not, a, I think, an accidental one. Um, and he gives us this idea of of the the falcon, you know, circling, ringing around in circles in the air. Um, and the rung upon the rain, we might think um, of if you've ever seen horses on a, those long reins that they're being, you know, as they go in, in circles to be trained. Um, mm -hmm. So rung upon a rain, we can see this, we can see the, the wind hover circling as if on an invisible um, leading string, you know, circling around on a wimpling right. wing that, that the um, folded rippling um, wing as you have his feathers rippling as the air catches it. And of course, as I, as I um, annotate here, wimpling has the additional meaning of with the appearance of a wimple, which is the folded right. linen garment that a religious sister would characteristically wear at that time. So he's yeah. using wimpling to mean folded, but again, he's bringing in a word that has these echoes of, of a religious sensibility because this poem is about Christ. Yes, yes. And um, you see that, uh, you know, we have these descriptions, we get the picture, we have the words that are giving us suggestions of, of Christ. Um, and then possibly my favorite line in this poem, my heart in hiding stirred for a bird. My heart in hiding. What an amazing line to think about what it might mean to have our heart be in hiding. Hiding from whom? From Christ, presumably. Hmm. That hidden heart, the, the afraid, the shy, the barricaded heart, the heart is in hiding. And now he speaks, you know, he's speaking first person, my heart in hiding, stirred, stirred for a bird, stirred at the sight of this Christ image. And then yeah. the rest of it just sort of tumbles out as a praise to Christ whom, who has moved him so much. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, even the use of the word bird is a lot more of a basic word than most of the words he's using there. So it, it, when he says, my heart stirred for a bird, it kind of, um, there's also the sense of surprise that a bird would be something that would stir your heart. You yeah. Know? Uh. Um, yeah. And also, um, yeah, the achieve of the mastery of the thing. So that, again, that's a achieve we can we can we can basically understand what he means there but it is an unusual uh approach to not say achievement 
you know, but just to say achieve. And it and the way he gives the two phrases, the achieve of uh, the mastery of the thing, you know, you get the sense that the, the poet narrator is at a loss for words. So overwhelmed right. by this moment that he can't quite find the right word. And he's he's tumbling over his own words to say it, which is such a testament to Hopkins skill, because this is, of course, an extremely carefully crafted poem, giving the impression of the poet stumbling for words in, in the midst of it and then i love yes. that the 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 um the sestat those which we have put here very helpfully hopkins breaks into the two the two sets of, of three lines there we have that first set of three lines in the sestat where he's just praising beauty beauty and valor and act oh air pride bloom here buckle he's overwhelmed yes. it's all bursting out and it all comes down to him being praising christ everything is just it's christ is so much lovelier more dangerous oh my chevalier oh my knight it's yes thing. christ is dangerous yeah well uh also that first line brute beauty and valor and act oh air pride plume here buckle uh that's something that he does a fair amount with that those that succession of strong beats sort of a listing of things i i want to say maybe he does that in um does he do that in pied beauty as well he doesn't uh, something places. something like it's that very, yeah it's a very characteristic um, hopkins move Right. And there, of course, the, the rhythm, the, the ambit pentameter is just thrown out the window because you get right, all exactly. succession. But that's the point. He's he's doing it at a, a peak of emotional intensity where mm -hmm. every word gets a stress. Air, pride, bloom, here. That yeah. is the point. Because at this point, it breaks the pattern. It's really meaningful. It's not random. It's not coincidental. It's, it's so powerful that it just bursts it open. And then yeah. look at what he does in the very la in the closing lines of it. He eases off. No wonder of it. And the last three lines are very meditative, and he changes his image entirely. We've been focusing on the swirling hawk, and now we have a plow being drawn through a field. Um, sheer plod, just plodding through the field pulling the plow or going behind the plow pulled by the horse plow down silly and shine and this is really interesting because again we are a bit detached from an agricultural context that hopkins mm -hmm. and his contemporaries would have been much more familiar with the cilian is the is the furrow made by the plow in the earth that's one of the things i gloss here so mm -hmm. simply plodding through the plow being dragged down through the furrow makes the plow shine. You might think of the claws of a bird here, uh, you know, the, 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 the plow uh, making ruts in the earth, like the, the claws of a bird, if it would huh. get raked with the, you, you know what I mean? Possibly. Um, but I think his, his emphasis here is on the way, because sheer plod makes plow shine. He shifts his image, yeah. so now he's got the, the the perhaps rusty old plow by the very act of being dragged through the soil. It's cleaning off the rust. That that right. laborious thing is making it shine, and so that's one image. And now he right. shifts to a totally different image: blue bleak embers, so um, coals in the fire, fall. They gall themselves, and I gloss that, injure themselves, wound themselves, in other words, break open. If you've ever right. seen a fire in a fireplace, you have these sort of gray, ashy, dull coal, falls, breaks open, and inside, gold vermilion. Yeah. And what's inside the ashy core? Beauty. It has to be right. broken. How do we make the plow to be shining and sharp? By b pulling it through the earth, by making these gashes. Right. So we have this this hint of what he means in ordinary life then of yes the danger 